Welcome to the IOS seminar series. My name is Andrea Maestas. I'm part of the team at Los Alamos National Lab and I'll be your host for today. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction to IWEST just for anyone who might be joining us for the first time. IWEST is an initiative funded by the US Department of Energy to provide communities across six Intermountain West states with data, tools, and information for energy transition planning. IWEST takes a place based approach, which frames everything we do in the context of the geographical, environmental, and demographic attributes of the Intermountain West. We take a technology neutral approach that explores energy options and opportunities across numerous symbiotic energy economies. And those technologies are assessed in tandem with societal readiness, which we believe is key to ensuring an equitable energy transition. And those assessments are all done through community engagement and coalition building to encourage regional partnerships. Today's seminar will introduce an open source tool called the Energy Policy Simulator, which was developed by Energy Innovation and the Rocky Mountain Institute to evaluate energy policies and visualize their potential impacts on revenue, greenhouse gas emissions, air quality, employment, and many other factors that we think about um, as we strategize on energy transition. So I first learned about the energy policy simulator at a conference that was held in Albuquerque last month. And I was just super excited about all the different types of analyses that could be done with this single tool and on a state by state basis. So I'm really excited to introduce our speakers for today. They are from energy, Innovate, energy Inno innovation, one of the companies that was involved in developing this tool. Um, we have Rachel Goldstein, who is a research and modeling manager at Energy Innovation. She's focused on their modeling and analysis program where she oversees energy policy research projects. Ra uh, Rachel holds a BA in environmental biology and engineering from Washington University, as well as a master's in energy policy and climate science from John Hopkins University. We also have Olivia Ashmore, who is a policy analyst at Energy Innovation, also focused on their modeling and analysis program. She led the development of the state level models in the energy policy simulator, which we'll hear about today. Olivia holds a bachelor's in environmental, science, uh, environmental studies from Oberlin College and a master's of public policy from UC Berkeley. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you take it, Olivia. Great, thanks, Andrea. And thanks for sharing your screen, Olivia. Um, we can get started. Uh, thanks again for the introduction. Um, I can kind of skip over what I was gonna say there, but. Just want to say thank you to everybody who's joining us today. Again, my name is Rachel Goldstein. I'm a research and modeling manager here at Energy Innovation, um, and my colleague Olivia Ashmore, policy analyst, will um, be showing us a bit of a demonstration on our state level tools for the energy policy simulator today. So, next slide. Um, so, today we'll be telling you a bit about the energy policy simulator, its capabilities and structure. And towards the end, we'll do some demonstrations with the tool and leave some time for Q and A. And for a little history here, the EPS, we'll refer to it as the EPS quite a bit. So um, don't be too confused by the acronym. It was originally published in 2015 for a US national model to analyze the potential impacts of US climate policies. And since then, we've developed several other country models and those models have been updated with the times to stay relevant. And recently, energy innovation, um, particularly Olivia and some other folks, worked closely with RMI to develop an EPS model for every U.S. state. And we believe that will have some really far-reaching policy impacts as states further develop their climate strategies. Next slide, please. So. The EPS is designed to help policymakers understand which policies will be 
most effective at helping them reach their goals to reduce carbon emissions and transition to clean and renewable energy. Um, it also gives us information about financial and health impacts. So we can see how many people um, will be impacted by certain policies um, as well as the costs associated with those policies or the cost savings. Um, the priority of the model here is to enable policy decisions that are unbiased and supported by real data. So to do this, typically we first create a business as usual scenario using a variety of reputable national and state level data sources. And with that, we're able to create a projection of emissions. So on this um, graph here, it might be a little hard to see, but the top, there's a black line and that indicates the business as usual scenario. Um, and that business as usual scenario, and again on the axis, the Y axis might be a little hard to read, but that is uh, CO2 emissions. So here we're just seeing what the business as usual scenario for um, keeping things as they are, what those emissions will look like. Um, and then with the model, we can layer different policies in and see how that'll impact um, emissions moving forward. So each of the colors in this graph represents a different policy package organized by sector. Um, at the bottom, again, very small, so it might be a little hard to see, um, includes all the different policies that are being added into this model. Um, the green line at the very bottom is, uh, a, sorry, again, the graph is just a little small for the screen, but um, the green line at the bottom should represent total emissions reductions from the policy packages all combined. So I'll note, and we'll get a little bit more into this. The model is an interactive systems dynamic model which means the policies are not necessarily additive on top of each other, but um, rather they interact with one another. For example, a clean electricity standard will further drive down emissions associated with electric vehicle use. You know, if we have a very clean grid, um, using electric vehicles in addition to that is going to yield an even, uh, even more carbon emissions than if we kept the grid as it is. Um, the model also uses annual time step and forecasts from 2020 out to 2050. So there are a lot of policies we can consider and the EPS kind of helps us cut through the noise and identify which policies are going to be the most impactful and cost effective and show us how they interact with other policies in a package. Uh, next slide, please. So here we can talk a little bit about how policies interact with each other. I gave one example, but we can dig a little deeper. Um, so we can consider a case where you add renewables to the grid and also adopt energy efficiency measure, measures, which um, each one abates, uh, for example, one unit of carbon dioxide on their own. Um, but together you would achieve less than two units of abatement simply because the efficiency lowered the electricity demand, meaning the renewables didn't deliver the same level as ab of abatement as they would just on their own. And to be clear, that is not saying that this is bad policy um, or not to do this. It's rather just to recognize how policies can interact with each other and when they have bigger impacts and lesser impacts and what needs to be done in addition to further um, remove carbon emissions. And again, we can think of um, the example that I talked about before with um, electrifying transportation, having a full electric vehicle fleet, and also um, making the electricity grid full of renewables and having very, very low carbon emissions. Um, and here you would receive, while there are two different policies you're working on, you would achieve more than two units of abatement because electrification is more effective when it's powered by a very clean grid. Um, and some other things to note about our model, the EPS is a hybrid model. It combines two different aspects, um, two different kinds of model types. We have top down and bottom up um, things that interact with the model. So the top down model starts with identifying a big picture situation like how changes in population or GDP will affect energy demand um, and it'll work downward and will draw on variables like elasticities and fuel prices from these models. 
um, essentially how is the model going to meet the big picture demand um, and what is that energy makeup going to be? And then from the bottom up level, um, we're starting with very detailed level, very final energy consumption and build up the system from there. So, in that case, we're taking variables like technology costs and efficiencies from these models. Um, and by allowing these 2 different types of. Uh, model components to interact with each other, we can make a bit more of a. Accurate and, um. Data driven um, analysis on on these factors. Another thing to note, um, this is an open source model, which is really cool. Um, we use a, a program called Vensim um, to work within our model, and we also have a web tool. Both the Vensim version of our model and the web tool can be um, run for free. Um, so whether you are new to this kind of modeling work and you just want to play around with the web tool, which is quite user friendly, or if you want to dig down into the weeds a bit more, um, we have this publicly available free software that you can use to um, explore what the model can do. Um, the model is economy wide. It covers many different sectors, including industry, agriculture, buildings, transportation, land use, electricity, uh, CCS, district heat, hydrogen, research and development, um, fuel sectors, and produces outputs for things like energy usage, pollutants, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, um, economic impacts, and health impacts. So that was a real mouthful. Um, if you do use the web tool, uh, you'll be able to see all of the inputs and outputs, and, and Olivia will demonstrate this a little bit more as well. Um, it also includes an input-output model downstream of energy and policy modeling um, that can help to identify in-state economic changes to things like GDP and jobs. Um, and here we use, uh, just for the health components, we used um, the EPA data to um, estimate associated public health benefits of climate policies, um, such as reductions in health-related pollutants and associated changes like reduced asthma attacks or visits to the hospital or premature mortality. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll do a very brief overview of a couple of sectors that we um, that play a big role in this model. Um, first, we can chat about the building sector. The building sector takes into account several factors that impact energy usage and emissions. Um, we break up the building sector types by rural, residential, urban, residential, and commercial. Um, I'll also note that in some countries and other models, this wasn't really the breakdown that we needed, so we adjusted it a little bit so, to things like um, multifamily versus single family. So there's a lot of different ways we can do it. Um, in the US, this is kind of what made the most sense for um, the analyses we were doing. And then we'll look at other elements like heating and cooling sources, um, ventilation, lighting and appliance use, um, and more. And of course, the generation makeup of the grid impacts the, em the emissions from anything in the building sector that is pulling from the power sector. Uh, next slide. Now, the industrial sector can make up a pretty big portion of a state's emissions, and it's important that we gather all these kinds of information. It's a lot. Um, we usually collect these from ISIC codes, and several of these subdivisions can interact with other elements of the model. Um, you know, the, each of these particular manufacturing sectors um, are quite carbon intensive in and of themselves, and some of them even are um, industrial areas that contribute to the usage of these fuels. Of course, you can see coal mining and oil and gas extraction on here. Um, next slide. Now, for the electricity sector, this one's super interesting, um, not only because I come from uh, research in the electricity sector myself, but just because it is kind of at the crux of so much of the decarbonization and the electrification process that um, we see happening. Um, but the model builds to meet forecasted demand, which I sort of talked about before, by dispatching new power generation, and it takes into account things like fuel cost, curtailment, and technology flexibility, 
Um, and right now we're actually in the process of revamping the electricity sector in the model. So more to come on that soon, but we're still, we're even improving the accuracy of it and what we can do with it and looking into capacity expansion models. Um, so more to come and very excited to see where that'll go. Um, for now, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, and so, yeah, the transportation sector um, here, we differentiate between different passenger modes and freight modes. So um, we'll divide up. Uh, light duty vehicles, which are your typical uh, passenger vehicles, like cars and SUVs from heavy duty vehicles, like buses. Um, and then, of course, we've got trains, boats, motorbikes. And then, of course, there's freight modes too, which are not pa passenger carrying vehicles, but do make up a large portion of the transportation sector, such as heavy trucks carrying um, things across the country or freight rail, freight shipping. And then what we'll do is we'll look into um, the various vehicle technologies, such as gasoline engine vehicles, diesel engine, um, and of course we've got our plug-in hybrids, battery electric vehicles, um, and that's just a really useful way to explore how the um, the sector is evolving. And next slide, please. Um, here we just have a list of some of the main data sources that we use, so you can see where we're pulling everything from. Um, so most of our sectors are coming from national government resources like EIA, EPA, and NREL. Um, every now and then, especially for the state level models, we had to dig a little deeper to find more nuanced data. So that usually would come from state level um, data. And I think I'm going to pass it over to Olivia as we move into our examples and demonstration portion of the presentation. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of our goals we had initially with the state models and then some of the ways it's been used by different states. So initially our goal open source so states can have the ability to do quantitative analysis to inform their policy making. We know states are trying to rapidly decarbonize and that it can be really time and resource intensive to model their greenhouse gas, gas emission profile and then analyze the potential policy impacts. And this kind of analysis is usually provided by really expensive consultants um, over the course of a year or two years. And so our hope is to provide rigorous quantitative analysis and insights that are available for free and be open source um, and that are, are modifiable by users. So you can make changes and adjust as needed. A couple use cases. Uh, the first one is in Michigan. Uh, the EPS in Michigan was used to analyze the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. Uh, the Michigan Office of Climate and Energy in 2022 put together a plan to cut state greenhouse gas emissions and reach the state's 2030 and 2050 targets. Um, a group in Michigan called Five Lakes Energy, as well as the Michigan Environmental Council, NRDC, and RMI were able to analyze the plan's potential impact. And they were found, found that while the plan was very effective, it didn't quite get to its 2030 target. Um, this allowed them to do a gap analysis and using the EPS, we're able to come up with some recommendations that would close the gap between the plan's impact and the 2030 target. In Colorado, the plan is currently being used by the Colorado Energy Office. Um, so RMI is using the EPS to support the development of the state's second greenhouse gas emissions reduction roadmap. This is a pathway to reduce emissions and meet the state's many climate targets in the coming years. They're able to model the impact of major federal funding, including things like the IRA, and then model the state's current policies um, that exist now and projected future policies. They're currently presenting this to the public and they're able to use the EPS tool in the public version to solicit feedback and allow users to create their own scenarios and provide input on Colorado's planning process. Uh, we also supported Louisiana's Climate Initiative Task Force in 2022. Um, they were using the EPS tool to analyze the potential impact of policies in Louisiana and the ability to meet the state's 2050 net zero greenhouse gas goal. 
um, the governor's initiative task force used the tool iteratively. So they would suggest a policy and then analyze the potential impact and then potentially revise the policy. And this was able to you know, provide really important insights. Um, for example, that hydrogen is most effective when coupled with a clean electricity grid. So industrial fuel switching and clean electricity go hand in hand. So this is the landing page for all of our energy policy simulators. It's at energypolicy.solution. You can then access the U.S. state models of the says U.S. states. This will bring you to the state landing page, which includes a little bit of background on this project, um, the state model, links to the state models, as well as links to the documentation. Um, I'm just going to briefly show you the documentation over here. As Rachel said in her presentation, we do all of the modeling for the state EPS tools in something called Vensum, which is a open source software that you can download and use. Um, we include instructions of how to download and use the tool. Um, there's a video series that provides an introduction of the tool. And then we also have um, under model components, a detailed methodological documentation by sector. So for example, this is the transportation sector methodology, and it goes through how we calculate emissions and the potential impacts of different policies. Under model regions, I can point you to the US state EPS methodology, which provides um, a more detailed overview of the sources we used in developing the state EPS models, some basic model assumptions, and then the different methods by sector. So we explain how we came up with our estimates for building sector, energy emissions, and things like that. Um, under the NDC scenario section, we go over what's included in a scenario I'll show you that's built into the tool. It's called the US NDC scenario. Um, to download um, any of the underlying data for a state, you can click on the state name over here. Um, this will bring you to this download button, which will trigger a download of all of the underlying data, which is thousands of files, as well as um, a version of the EPS that you can use on your desktop um, if you download the Benson model re reader. And we heard from Andrea that it, uh, this is a technical audience. And so if you're interested in you know, digging deep into our calculations and methodology, um, I'd recommend you know, downloading the entire version of the tool and then reaching out to us if you need further assistance learning how to use it. I'm now just going to um, flip back to the state landing page and enter one of the state models, which you can do by clicking on the map here. Uh, so we can check out New Mexico. I'm going to click this enter simulator button. And this will bring you to the state landing page, which includes a business as usual scenario line and then a greenhouse gas reduction target if the state has one. Um, we can see that this you know, runs through 2050. Um, it's an annual time step, as Rachel had said. And then the y axis will vary based on the graph, but in this case is a million metric tons CO2 per year. We have many different outputs. Like actually we have hundreds of different outputs we provide in this online tool um, and you can access them all by using this drop down. This is a graph category and then graph subcategory over here. So for emissions, we include you know, emissions by sector. So we can toggle to this version of the graph and it'll show the breakdown um, of emissions by sector, including electricity, land use, transportation, et cetera. Um, I would recommend making an account and then signing in. This will allow you to download any of the graph data. It'll allow you to save scenarios um, and name scenarios. And to create a scenario, I'm just going to click to this view. 
um, you're going to use this left hand bar over here. Um, so this allows you to apply a policy onto the business as usual version of the existing uh, model. So, for example, there's transportation policies um, that include things like an EV sales standard. There's building policies that include things like energy efficiency and building electrification. The electricity sector has things like a clean electricity standard or early retirement of power plants. The industry sector has things like carbon capture and sequestration and industrial electrification and hydrogen fuel switching. Agriculture has things like avoided deforestation and reforestation, as well as um, methane mitigation for livestock. The district heat and hydrogen sector um, has the ability to shift hydrogen production to electrolysis. So it'll go from using natural gas as a default um, for hydrogen production, production to uh, clean electricity and electrolysis. Cross sector includes thing like, things like a carbon price and then some nuance in how to apply that carbon price. And then research and development will apply um, a research and development learning curve acceleration to things like direct air capture. The government revenue accounting is a way to allocate tax revenue. Um, you probably won't need to use this, but if, for example, you apply a carbon tax and you want to direct where the carbon tax revenue is going, um, you can do that under this policy. So to set a policy, I'm going to use the electricity standard as an example. You just click on it under the drop down, and it'll bring you to the slider bar. Um, as well as this link to learn more about the policy. If you click on this, it includes um, some state-specific information. So, for example, New Mexico's um, estimated, you know, business as usual, gas values, as well as some information on just how the policy is applied in the model. Um, you can also link to the documentation here and see how the model handles it. So to actually turn on the policy, you're going to grab the slider bar and drag it to your desired level. I'm going to do 100% clean electricity standard. And you'll see the model will update in real time to reflect those changes. Um, by default, this will phase in linearly, so starting in 2022 through 2050. Um, but you can change the implementation schedule of the policy by clicking this Customize Implementation Schedule button. So, for example, if you wanted the policy to, you know, reach 100% by 2035, you could do that here. You're going to click add, type in the year, and the percent implementation. So, if we want 100% of the policy implemented by 2035, we can do 100% here. Click OK, and you'll see this graph will update. And click save, and the model will update in real time. So we can see how, you know, reaching that 100% clean electricity standard by 2030 really changes the future emissions projections. And to help you get started using the tool, we have some built-in scenarios. One is the business as usual, which includes state-specific policies that are already enacted when we made the tool, which was about a year ago at this point, um, as well as an NDC pathway. And the NDC pathway was developed to meet the US NDC goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions about 50% by 2030 um, and reaching around net zero by 2050. So we took this package and applied it to the state. Um, so you can see the impact of multiple different policies all at once. Um, and before I toggle to the graph that'll show the results, does anyone wanna put in the chat or guess um, what policy would be most effective in New Mexico at reducing emissions? Can't actually see the chat, but hopefully people are responding um, and getting some good guesses. Um, I'll flip to what's our wedge diagram, which will show the contributions of different policies. And so we can see that a methane capture and destruction policy is going to contribute the most um, emissions reductions in this scenario. So hopefully someone guessed that right. Um, New Mexico has been implementing a lot of 
oil and gas measures. Um, and we can see that that would be a really impactful policy in this state. So this shows the contribution of different policies towards the policy package. Um, we can see in early years, but retirement of the coal and gas power plants will have a big impact. And then in later years, like things like methane capture, building electrification, city standards. There's a few other graphs I want to highlight. Um, one is this abatement cost curve. If you're familiar with the McKinsey cost curves, this is a very similar analysis. It takes the net present value um, in terms of either cost savings or um, you know, additional costs associated with the policy and then compares it to the abatement potential. So the width is the abatement potential and the y-axis is the cost, policy cost or policy savings. So we can see some policies you know, are associated with a lot of savings and then some are more expensive and are associated with additional costs. Um, like Rachel said, we produce both financial and health outcomes. So in this scenario, we can see change in jobs in the state. Uh, so these jobs are all um, estimated to be within the state of New Mexico. So we can see that there's a net positive job growth of about 40,000 jobs by 2050 in the NDC pathway. For human health benefits, I just want to highlight um, the percent change in premature mortality by race. This can be helpful in understanding the equity impacts of different policy packages and seeing how things like premature mortality, asthma attacks, hospitalizations can all go down as you apply clean energy policies. Um, one last graph I'll highlight is just the electricity generation graph. Um, we have a forecast, as Rachel said, of the power sector profile, which includes both renewable and non-renewable fuels. Um, so in the NDC scenario, you can see we're phasing out coal and natural gas. We're leaving some natural gas peaker in place and then adding a ton of onshore wind and solar. Um, this is currently getting an update. So this um, section of the model will be improved to um, be more of like a, an hourly capacity model um, coming soon, hopefully in January or February. I will stop there and I can stop sharing and we can field some questions. Um, thank you so much for hanging in there with us. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Does anybody have questions? I want everyone to feel comfortable going off mute here. And if there are some scenarios that maybe you would like them to show you using the tool, um, Olivia, would that be okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. If you have questions about the tool, I'm happy to share screen again. I appreciate how uh, the tool works. Thank you guys for putting that together. I was just wondering how you proved its uh, efficacy looking in arrears and saying, okay, well, what what would we have expected? In other words, you're, you're, everything's forward oriented. Have you validated the model in a past tense sort of way? That's a good question. Um, I believe we have. Our developer um, initially worked closely to get the tool peer reviewed by groups like NREL, LBNL, um, Stanford, other universities. And I guess part of that process, they looked at what we were forecasting in terms of, you know, things like clean energy adoption compared to what's actually happened. Um, as you probably know, most models are too conservative on clean energy adoption. And so we've, you know, you're The other question I have is uh, on fossil, uh, which is an important part of our local economy here. I didn't see anything, and obviously it was a very quick flash through, but do you show reductions to state tax revenues and local property taxes and other things by the elimination of fossil and or the addition of uh, quote unquote clean energy? Yeah, we do have ways to show that. Um, you would actually have to dig into the Venson version of the tool. Um, those are some of the detailed outputs we have um, in the kind of like 
the non-web um, version of the tool. But if you're interested in doing that, yeah, it can help you track like a reduction in fuel tax revenue um, and the impact on a state budget. And I'm talking about royalties and severance. It's not fuel tax that an individual consumer would pay. But if, if for example, a policy resulted in the reduction of natural gas production in the state by 20 or 30 percent because it's not economic, that obviously has implications on carbon, but it also has huge implications on public sector tax revenue and property taxes. I'm wondering if that kind of logic is incorporated in the model as well. I don't think we currently include royalties, um, but that is something we could probably easily model for you if you were interested. Well, it's, it's a big deal because there are no royalties paid or severance taxes paid on any renewable energy. And yet a state like New Mexico is collecting, you know, several billion dollars over what it spends as a result of royalty and severance taxes. So, you know, being able to model all sides of the Rubik's cube is something that appears to be missing right now in the model. So I'm just pointing that out. Yeah, that's a, that's a good um, thing to point out. So there is a question in the chat. Have you had difficulty getting good data for certain states? Uh, good question. We are relying mostly on national data sources um, that include state specific um, data. So we've had a lot of luck getting data from NREL, EPA, and EIA. Um, I'll, I'll note that there are two states that we don't have models for Alaska and Hawaii. We were unable to get the appropriate data we needed for the electricity sector in those states. Um, that's been our major limitation is just those two, but the rest of the states we've been able to access really high quality data um, from national sources. So, if somebody is working on a project or is curious about using the tool um, to evaluate a particular uh, policy, can they reach out to you for some direct support? Is that something you guys do or is everyone on their own using the tool? No, we can provide direct support. Um, yeah, I would recommend as a starting place going to the documentation that I shared and there's a video series that will help you get started with the tool as well as a ton of detailed direction on how to download and use the tool and understand the model. Um, I would start there and then we have like a general um, contact information email that we can share um, that you can use uh, if you have any follow up questions about the tools specifically. Okay, that's great. Um, there's another question from Christine King. What type, what kind of plants are you modeling for nuclear energy? Large plants? And where are you getting your inputs? And so, Christine, feel free to go off mute and expand on that um, if you if you need to. So, Olivia, do you want to address that question? Yeah. So, we're um, in the current version of the tool. We're modeling like large scale nuclear power plants, and we're taking data from EIA's um, 923 and 860 reports every year. Um, going forward, we're going to include um, the ability to model like small modular reactors as well. So that'll be in the upcoming version of the tool that uh, we're hoping to release in the coming year in 2024. Does that answer your question? Well, a little bit. Where are you getting the information for the small modeling, the small modular reactors? That's um, estimates taken from like a national level at this point. So we're using um, national level data that will incorporate into the states. Um, I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. You come in and out. I don't know if that's the case for others, but. Yeah, it's been that way throughout the seminar. So Olivia, maybe you can give it another go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I can point you to our documentation when the model comes out, but we use national level data for the small modular reactors. And apply those estimates to the state. The re the reason I'm asking is because and 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 maybe what I'll do is just put my email in the chat. We've been working on the capacity planning models associated with nuclear energy. Um, so I, I lead a program um, focused on these smaller reactors. So um, 
maybe there's some more up to date information we can help you with. Um, I will tell you some of the EIA data is is not what we would choose. That's great to hear, and I hopefully we'll reach out to you um, at some point and ask for some state specific data. We would love your advice on this. We, in particular, we are adding cost data into the NREL ATB um, in the coming year. So there'll be um, new cost data for, but, but this is a emerging space. So anyway, I'll just put my email in the chat and if you'd like to discuss, that'd be great. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions out there? I had one about the retirement of fossil. I want to make sure I was understanding that is, are you applying the retirement of. Fossil by 2030 across all models. In your business as usual scenario, I was trying to figure out what the business as usual scenario is. Uh, no, I can show you our business as usual scenario again. I think what I had shared was like the clean electricity standard example. Um, can we see this again? Um, so this is the NDC pathway, um, but the business as usual would retain uh, most of the natural gas non-peaker capacity through 2050. It does retire on most of the coal. Yeah, so, but you, you do have most of your coal retiring in the early 2030s. It varies by state. So um, it depends okay. on the local coal prices, the like expected retirement of power plants and things like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, we have a relatively small group today, so it's a great opportunity for more interactive Q and a here. So feel free to go off mute and ask questions. We have another 1 in the chat from Dan Crosby. Um, that must be interesting when states halt construction on current gas powered power plant projects. So I guess it's more of a, a comment. Dan, do you want to go off mute and expand on that a little bit? Well, I guess not, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> all right, any other questions before we, oh, Chris, Chris has a comment. Um, Chris would like to suggest that the model add in more, um, more data perhaps from non-governmental entity entities. Correct. So, uh, you know, we, the best we have is NREO and EIA and, and EPA. I got that, but. There are political agendas baked into all of those entities, and I think having a broader set of data from the American Petroleum Institute, or in the case of New Mexico, the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association, et cetera, would help bring more validity to the, the model. I love the open source nature of the model and the ability to see how it's working, uh, the coding and things like that, uh, I think bring credibility to your analytical rigor but the input streams could be uh, more varied and diverse. And that goes back to the lady uh, commenting on nuclear, for example. So, you know, looking at uh, job losses, royalties, severance taxes, school property taxes, all those other things are kind of seemingly inconveniently ignored in the model, suggesting that, you know, all of these clean initiatives are, are without opportunity costs. And I don't think that's really true. And I, I don't think anybody here on the call believes that's true and it's tough to model those, I got that. But to, to use as a policy tool, I think the more inputs and implications we have and the more variety and richness of input sources, the better. Yeah, I would agree. Oh, go ahead, Olivia. Oh, I was gonna say, you know, in general for these tools, we use national data sources, but we're always open to collaboration. If, for example, you wanted to make a version of the tool that used a different data source, um, We've worked with other groups to help them do that if they have, for example, like a different forecast of, you know, the energy sector that they want to um, use instead of our default forecast. 
Well, there's another question in the chat. Is it, this is from Nancy Partridge. Is it possible to compare pending policy impacts in two different states? Um, projections for electricity, for example. Yeah, so we have versions of all the state models. Um, so you can access all state models um, at once online. Um, and then I think for any pending models or pending policies, we don't you know, update the states continuously with pending policies. We update them about once a year with only you know, signed legislation. Um, so if you wanted to model, for example, like a pending clean electricity standard in multiple states, you could use the policy settings on the left hand side that I shared um, and model you know, several states um, clean electricity standard impact. Does that answer your question? I'll let Nancy follow up in the chat if she has any other. Oh, yes, she said yes, it does. Um, and then Christine King had another question. Is it possible to group states together and evaluate a region? So I think you've kind of addressed that. And will you also be adding in hydrogen hubs? Yeah, um, we hope to. We're undergoing a process right now of looking at the impacts of the IRA and we'll bake that into the state's um, analysis in the coming year. So I think our goal is ultimately yes, to include analysis of hydrogen hubs um, in the models. It's a pretty challenging modeling task and we just got a bunch of information on it. So it'll, I think, likely be at some point in the next year. Um, and then on the question of regional analysis, the models are not able to be used regionally. They're um, basically operate as an island. So any of the jobs impacts associated with the state are you know, assumed to be within that state. You could add up multiple states results and look at a region, but they won't interact with each other. So if you build tons of solar in New Mexico, you can't import it into, you know, a different model. And on that note, we do have a national model if you wanted to look at the national um, implications and interactions. Great. Well, um, last call for questions. And Andrea, um, of course, if anyone does have questions, feel free to chime in. Um, I just wanted to note if you want to send around our email addresses um, to folks on the call, we'd be happy to have follow ups um, if people have questions that aren't addressed here, um, but that they would like to ask later on. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think if anyone is interested in um, asking for your contact information, I would just encourage them to send an email to me through the iwest at lanl.gov email address and we'll, we'll share contact information for you too. Well, thank you so much, Rachel and Olivia. This has been really great. I think it's such a powerful tool and um, we'll be posting a recording of this seminar as well as your slides, which should have a link to the simulator. And maybe we can include your contact information there. And, and anyone who wants to access those resources can go to the iWest website. That's iWest.org. If you click on the events page, you'll find links to all of these resources. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Everyone. Bye. Have a great day.